Well, welcome. Good evening, everybody. And welcome to this evening's webinar, Breeding Goals, Practical Genetics for Beef Production. I'm Ellen Crane, the Extension Coordinator for the Beef Cattle Research Council, and I'll be your moderator for tonight. This session will last for approximately one hour, but may go longer depending on the number of questions you have for us later on during the question and answer period. If you're on Twitter, tweet along with us using the hashtag beefwebinar. We are recording this session and I will email out the link to the recording to everyone that registered in a couple of days. So if you miss anything tonight or you want to watch it again later, you can do that. Of course, you'll be able to hear and see tonight's presenters, but we can't hear or see you. If you want to communicate with us, type into the, the Q&A section or the chat window, which will be located at the top or the bottom of your screen. And we'll answer all of your questions at the end of the hour. If your internet connection is a bit slow, it might help if you close the box here that shows the video, which means that you can't see us, but hopefully the audio will come through a bit more clear for you. So with that, let's get rolling. So this is what we will be covering tonight. You will hear from two presenters that will be speaking about practical genetics for beef production and how to implement those on your operation. Before I hand things over to our first speaker, I want to take a moment to uh, over, go over overview of uh, some resources that we have available on beefresearch.ca. Uh, we have recently published a set of resources developed to assist you with record keeping. And one of those topics that's covered in the record keeping modules is genetics. Uh, and it's available through different levels. So whether you're just starting out uh, trying to do a bit, job, bit better job of uh, selecting or doing more work with your genetics or whether you're a little bit more advanced. Um, these levels have cut through some of the extra information and kind of focus on the information that you really need to know um, when it comes to, to some uh, genetic or record keeping. Um, and those are all free to use um, and they're available on beefresearch.ca under the resources tab and under record keeping. Um, and you'll see infographics like this one. Uh, we'll be talking about um, the sum. This here is showing a summary of crossbreeding systems, um, talking about different breed crossings, um, your rotation of your breeds, number of breeds, etc. But I'll let these guys get into this a bit later. They're the experts on this. But with that, I will hand things over to our first speaker. Our first speaker is Sean McGrath. He is a fifth generation rancher who together with his wife, Tanya, and their family manage a 112 year old operation breeding roughly 300 females each year and custom grazing another 200 pairs in the summertime. The ranch markets purebred and commercial cattle as well as grass finished beef and is structured around grazing. In 2014, the ranch was awarded, was awarded the Provincial and National Tessa Award. Sean also provides consulting services to the beef industry primarily focusing on livestock genetics and ranch and range management. Sean writes for several beef industry publications and through his company markets electric fencing supplies, forage seed, and range monitoring education and tools. Tonight, Sean will be speaking about breeding goals. Are you shooting at the right net? So with that, I will hand it over to you, Sean. There we go, does that, that hopefully looks like the right thing. Looks good. Okay, um, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for uh, inviting me to talk about this topic. It's, it's actually one of particular interest to myself. Um, just because I really get a kick out of trying to match cattle to the system rather than adapting the system to the cattle. Um, so, I think a legitimate question when we're, when we're going down this road of breeding cattle is just, are we shooting at the right net? Um, for most of us in the commercial industry, I mean, when we're buying new genetics or changing genetics, it typically resu results or is, is the result of, of bull purchases. Um, you know, if we're a herd that's retaining our own replacement females, you know, roughly 95 plus percent of our new genetics will come through, through sire purchases. And so, I've actually got a picture. This is our AI outfit where we AI in the summertime. 
Um, and it's just to, to put it in context of what we're actually buying when we're buying bulls or buying genetics is, is we're actually buying DNA that's going to go into our cow herd and produce something that hopefully fits our environment. Um, and so when I think about buying a bull, a bull is, you know, a bull is just an automated delivery system for the DNA that we're buying. So um, in the case of the picture, my left arm is the automated delivery system. Um, you know, so we really need to focus on the DNA that those, that those sires contain. Um, on the female side, it's, it's a little bit different because not only is she a DNA delivery system, but she's also um, the production facility. So um, a little more challenge, I guess, involved in, in sorting through the female side, but we'll kind of focus on the sire side tonight since that's probably where most of us are, are making our selection decisions. One of the problems with beef cows is that it takes a long time to breed a herd of beef cows. Um, you know, and when we start thinking, we've got to be thinking really long term. So when I think of a short term priority in terms of sire selection, um, that would be I'm going to buy a bull to breed my replacement heifers. I don't want to help heifers calve next spring. Calving ease is a short term type priority. Um, in the longer term, you know, it's 2021. Um, thankfully, 2020, 2020 is over. It's 2021. Um, if we buy a bull this year and made our cows, those calves aren't born until 22. They're not weaned until the fall of 22. If we're keeping replacement heifers, they're not bred until 23. They're not gonna calve until 2024. It doesn't take long until we're four and five years down, down the track of what, what we're trying to plan. So um, it's an important question to think about how are we gonna be producing or marketing cattle in five or 10 years? That should really be part of your decision on the, on the genetics you're sourcing today. Um, this is actually one of my favorite pieces of extension work done by uh, Melton in 95. Um, and basically he splits beef production into reproduction. So getting females bred, um, having calves staying in the cow herd production, which is basically growth and then product would be carcass. So if we're in a traditional system, so we're breeding cows, we're weaning calves, we're selling calves at the auction market in the fall. Um, reproduction is about five times more important to our decision making or our profitability than production. And it's 10 times more important than carcass. Um, you know, and at the coffee shop, you'll hear lots of guys talk about they wean 750 pound calves. What's really five times more important than that is what was their conception rate? What's the average age of their cows? Um, what's their culling rate? So um, if you're participating in a value chain, so that would be, you know, you're keeping ownership on your calves and, and selling them on a, on a grid. Well, then reproduction is twice as important as growth. But when you're looking at genetics, um, growth and carcass become equally important. Um, just because your profit's being driven by a weight and a quality um, priced on a hook. You know, and if we move to an integrated system, and there may be some of you on this call, um, that would be I own a cow herd and I own a grocery store or a meat shop. Um, all of a sudden carcass becomes a lot more important than reproduction or production. So again, we'll, we'll be picking genetics that, that may be very different and, and in most cases should be very different than our neighbors. Um, so that's just a question to keep in the back of your mind. Um, how am I gonna be producing and marketing these cattle in five or 10 years down the road? If we think about um, genetic potential and the environment we live in, um, you know, this, this slide gets a little busy maybe, but if, if we think about if we're, if we have a lot of feed availability um, all the way through to low feed availability, uh, and then think about the relative stress level on our cattle, we can see that, you know, if you've got a lot of feed available and you've got a low stress situation, so you're, you know, you're going out with a silage wagon and feeding your cows, um, you can actually stand fairly high milk production. So, you know, sort of the extreme example would be a Holstein um, in a dairy barn. Um, you're going to have bigger cows and they don't need to be able to put on a lot of back fat because you're bringing or they're being supplied with all that energy in their, in their ration. When we start to get into a little tougher situations, um, maybe not a lot of feed availability in a higher stress environment, we can't support or that cow can't support the gut mass and the organ mass to, to support high milk production, for example, and also rebreed and get pregnant. And we know from the previous slide, we know that reproduction is really important. Um, you know, cows in stressful situations, we want little fat cows. Um, you know, and, and I think as producers, we, we know that instinctually. If you, um, 
start in some of the tougher environments. So if you started south of Swift Current and drove, you know, north of St. Paul, Alberta, or, you know, or start driving towards the east where there's maybe a little more feed, cows get bigger, um, breed makeup will change a little bit. Uh, and you'll see that, you know, you'll wind up with cows with maybe a little more milk production, a little more performance because the environment will support that. So when we start to look at where these breeds fit in relation to things, um, when I, at the bottom here, when we think about a, a terminal crossbreeding system, so that would be, I've got a herd of maybe British type cows and I use a continental bull and sell all the calves. Um, we don't care what the milk production is on that terminal sire. Uh, you know, we want size, we want growth and we want calving ease. Um, those calves come out alive, we just want them to grow and, and have some carcass. So um, again, we'll, we'll be selecting a, a significantly different uh, maybe profile in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. So, you know, one of the things to be aware of is just, and we're, we're often not good at it is, is what's our environment. So um, this picture is actually a picture of our cows here a couple of weeks ago is about 50 below. Um, they're still on grass till hopefully next week. Um, you know, in our environment, um, just personally speaking, our cows can't support a lot of milk production because I'm not going to provide that feed availability. So one of the things we often lose sight of is this whole thing of heterosis and Ellen had a good slide at the start. Um, basically it's kind of here again. If we take a crossbred, the advantage of a crossbred calf, um, we're going to see a higher survival rate. We're going to see a higher calving rate on those calves. Um, we will see a little increase in birth weight on those cattle, um, but we'll also see you know, the work done at USDA Meat Animal Research shows 16 pounds of calf advantage to those crossbred calves over a straight bred calf. Um, if you add that together with the increase in calving rate and the increase in survival, that's significant. Um, where it becomes even more advantageous um, is when we think about on the cow side and, and maternal heterosis. Um, Again, I mean, we can see the advantages, but if we look at the advantage of a crossbred over over a commercial over a straight bred cow, um, it basically equates to adding one calf in her lifetime or having an extra calf per lifetime out of those crossbred cows. Um, so I think that's something we often overlook when we're trying to, when we're trying to trying to do this genetic thing on ranch. Um, and I think it's a really important thing to remember is just you know not every cow works out every time. Um, but that crossbred cow works out a lot better on average than, than, the, than a straight bred cow. Um, and again, so that kind of gets us into these breeding systems. And, and one of the issues we always hear about or talk about with crossbred cows is, is maybe some inconsistencies. And there's some things we can do to, to tackle that situation and keep from bouncing from one extreme to another. Um, you know, and, and I don't know on the call, I don't know what size your cow herd is. Um, but I think this is a real question we need to ask ourselves is, do I have enough cows to do some of these breeding systems? And if not, is there a better source or better way for me to do this? So can I focus on being a strictly maternal herd and selling replacement females to others? Or am I better to buy maternal cows and focus on just buying terminal bulls and, and, and marketing all of those calves? Um, you know, it takes, a, it takes a fair number of, of cows to, to implement some of these systems um, when you start getting into two and three and breed rotations and those types of things. Um, one of the things we want to do when we're picking bulls in these systems, so especially on the maternal side, um, we'll pick different breeds, but we want to pick um, animals that are similar in type. And if we, if we adjust their, their genetic profiles, they actually need to be similar in, in genetic profiles. So they'll obviously have some complementary traits, um, but if they can be sort of similar, what we can do is create a fairly consistent um, crossbred cow herd. You know, one of the questions I, I get a lot um, is, you know, what what bull should I use or what's my results going to be? Um, you know, and I, I always like to think that the simplest advice is if you know the bulls you've bought in the past, 
Um, and if obviously if they've been registered or papered, um, go look them up on the Breed Association website. So if I had owned a, a Hereford bull, Mr. Hereford, um, I could go on the Hereford website and look him up and see what his numbers are. Um, I could go on the Angus site and look up my Mr. Angus bull. Um, if those bulls have worked really, really well for you, um, go up and go look them up, have a look at their numbers. Um, you know, more bulls like that are probably aren't going to hurt you. Um, if you've got bulls that haven't worked out, go look them up right away so you don't buy more like that, right? Um, and it, it'll just kind of help you to anchor the numbers in your mind. Um, you know, and, and in a lot of cases, there's no point in buying genetics that have performance that our environment won't support. And there's there's somewhere there'll be a happy medium in your operation that just that works really well. So, you know, the obvious questions, um, <laughs> what problems do I have other than having cows? Um, you know, do I have calving issues? Do I have rebreeding issues? Do I have um, those types of things? What things work well in my operation? Um, you know, if you have an issue with open cows, um, some of it can be environment. Some of it can be that maybe you've got cows that are too productive. You know, thinking back to that earlier chart, maybe you've got cows that are too productive for um, what your environment will support. Maybe you need to provide more support or, you know, tweak the numbers a little bit. I've got on here calving distribution, and this is a really simple um, tool. You don't have to um, write down a lot of stuff. Um, and this is, would be an example here, this graph. Calving distribution can tell you an awful lot about your ranch and where your genetics fit within your ranch. So if, if the majority of your calves are coming in the first 21 days, um, your cows are obviously rebreeding quickly. Um, they probably fit your environment fairly well. If you see comparing year over year, those bars start to move towards that second trimester or sorry, second um, period or into that third period. So that 42 to 63 days, um, it may mean your environment's not supporting what you're expecting your cows to do. Um, you know, it can, it can help you to identify some of these things. Um, and, and really do a good job in terms of tweaking those genetic input choices. Um, you know, your records are yours, but they're there to help you understand your own ranch. And if you understand your ranch, you can start to understand what cattle fit in there better. Um, I've got financials here. That's, again, that's, that could be a hundred webinars. Um, but you know those financials and and profit margins gross margins will tell you a lot about if your cattle are performing in your system and or if your system is working and how you may need to adapt that system to the to the genetics you're selecting so um it's just really important and for most of us i mean priority one is just having good fertile cows um and that that should really be a focus for most of us you know and i get a lot of questions or I'm, I'll confess, I'm a numbers first guy. Um, we use the numbers to sort out the bulls that we're interested in going to look at. We would, we would tackle things that direction. Um, I wouldn't go look at a bull and think he's attractive and then go look at his numbers after. Um, but just because you use those numbers, so EPDs or other tools to assist in your selection, doesn't mean you don't go look at them. Remember, we're, we're, we're buying, we're interested in the DNA, but the delivery system still has to work. Um, you know, there's some traits, you know, particularly the maternal traits, those types of things. Uh, you probably want to go look at a bull's mom if you're, if you're going to use them to create replacement heifers. Um, the other thing is that the biggest number is not always best. Um, you know, and uh, we've seen there's some research in the U.S. that shows weaning weights haven't increased in 10 years, but feedlot and carcass weights have increased. You know, a lot of ranches just can't support that extra extra performance. So, um, you know, I think the numbers are important. It's important to look at the EPDs and those types of numbers to help us select, but biggest isn't always best. And it doesn't mean we're not concerned about phenotype and, and how that bull looks and moves and that he passes a semen test and those types of things. So the EPD numbers just help us compare certain traits between the choices we've got. So I think the question to take home is probably what, what's your plan? Um, you know, what does your farm look like? Uh, yeah, how much tame grass or native 
grass or how much cropland do you have? Um, our cowherd looks like our cowherd because we're about 85% native rangeland. Um, we have very minimal cropland resources. Um, you know, what's, what are your feed sources? If you've got the feed sources to support performance, well then you can push performance a little more. Um, some of you are calving now, some of you will calve later. What's your labor situation look like? Um, obviously if you've got more labor around, you, you can do some different things with those cows than maybe somebody that's got a little less labor availability. Um, you know, do you keep your own replacements? If you do, um, the bulls you are selecting likely will be different than if you're marketing all those calves. So really need to know what do you sell? When do you sell? How do you sell? And not just today, but thinking further out into the future, what, what your plan looks like. So I, I came up with our short list and I'm, I'm sure the next presenter is really going to like the pictures on this slide. Um, I, I do think the most important thing in your genetic selection needs to be the breeder that you're buying from um, in terms of integrity in their program, um, how they work with bull development uh, and what's their philosophy and obviously what's their breed and does that breed fit your goals. Um, we use EPDs heavily here. Um, I don't have labor. We look at a lot of calving ease. Uh, we look for smaller mature size. Uh, we actually are selecting for below average milk just because of our environment and how we run cows. Um, we spend a fair bit of investment on carcass merit. Um, and some other traits, we look at longevity, heifer pregnancy. Um, we're starting to look at dry matter intakes and feed intakes. And then because we retain ownership on our calves, we look at that spread between weaning and yearling weight just to make sure those calves will grow. Um, we rely pretty heavily on ultrasound to look at some of these carcass traits. Um, we have done a ton of DNA work. We uh, parentage every bull that walks onto the place. Um, you know, and then we're concerned about phenotype after that. And then price obviously comes into the equation at some point. So, um, you know, and again, that's, a, that's another discussion where your price point is, but it helps if you have a plan, you can come up with an objective price point on those cattle, so. You know, gen genetic selection really is about putting DNA into production. So you're buying DNA and you're selling performance. And, and really it's what performance fits your ranch and what performance your ranch can support. So Um, I think that's it for me. So I will see if I can unshare this. I can take over from there, Sean. There we go. Super. Okay. Um, just wanted to remind folks, if you have some questions already, and I suspect you do, um, feel free to drop them into the Q&A or into the chat function. You'll find them at the top or the bottom of your screen. And if you have a question, you can drop that in anytime. Okay, so our next speaker is Lance Leachman. So Lance, along with his wife, Sherry, operate Big Gully Farm near Maidstone, Saskatchewan. The firm consists of registered Hereford and whole Hereford herd, along with Angus females for the production of F1 black baldies. They use extensive artificial insemination, embryo transfer, carcass, and pregnancy ultrasound, and genomic enhanced EPD utilization are typical management practices. Big Gully Farm hosts an appreciation event, youth cattle judging clinic, and bull sale each fall. Cattle are typically exhibited at the Canadian Western Agribition and local field days. Lance studied animal science at Dodge City Community College and Kansas State University with a master's degree in animal breeding and genetics from Virginia Tech. He competed on or coached livestock judging teams at both of these schools. And tonight, Lance will be speaking about practical genetics for beef production, including some breeding scenarios. But first, I'm gonna uh, launch those poll questions for you, Lance, before I forget again. So we have a couple of polls here. 
Um, and I'm just going to launch them right now. So if you're able to answer these, are you happy with your current crossbreeding system? Yes, we have optimized our genetics. No, we could do better, or we are strictly purebred. Okay, it's starting to slow down here a little bit. I'll just give you a couple more seconds. Okay, so about 57% say no, we could do better. second question here. Here we go. Okay, and your second question is, in your opinion, who should be responsible for making breeding, breeding decisions based on the available data? Should that be the state stock breeder, yourself, breed associations, or another, in your opinion? There's a strong opinion on this one, Lance. Okay. We're starting to slow down here. Let's give you a couple more seconds. Okay. 90% uh, of them think it should be themselves that are looking at the data and making decisions. So we've got the right crowd here um, listening into the conversation tonight. So that's great. Okay, I will hand it over to you, Lance. Hey, first of all, I just want to thank Ellen for inviting Sean and I to be part of this and thank everyone for joining us this evening. Hopefully it's a benefit to you. I just want to say my presentation is not groundbreaking or really unique in any which direction. We were told to kind of keep it general. So hopefully there's young people that are maybe just getting started that can pick up some things and some food for thought for other folks. But I'll get started here just with a couple of three questions, and this is from Dr. Spangler at Nebraska, but basically it's very common sense and Sean touched on some of these things, but we come into selection and mating decisions. We just need to ask ourselves, first of all, what are our breeding and marketing goals? So setting some objectives as far as what our operation basically is based on for fiscal you know, responsibility or for profitability and production. And that's very diverse. And that's the beauty of the beef industry. And sometimes the challenge is that everybody has strong opinions and sometimes it seems like they get stronger, more variable all the time, but we have to just think about ourselves and what works best for us. And so then you go to the next questions, what traits directly impact profitability? And that needs to be thought of in both revenue expense. And Sean alluded to it earlier that we do a really good job a lot of times in measuring outputs or trying to talk about how much we had something weigh when it went to the cull market or when it was sold as a yearling or as a, cap in the fall but we haven't done as good a job traditionally on the input or probably the expense side of things and i think that's definitely improving you see a lot of research and new discussion regarding kind of winter feeding strategies and people that are trying to do a really good job of monitoring costs and their um, grazing days and those sort of things so i think we've improved that but it's not always about how big the animal is at weaning or how much performance and weight you've accumulated you have to take into account how much you've incurred to get to that point too. So just trying to think of the things that impact both your expense and revenue and determine how profitable you are or could be. And then environmental constraints. And Sean talked about this you know, earlier, but it's really important and needs to be touched on again. Just trying to figure out what acceptable levels of performance you can have for each trade based on the environment that you're under. And with that said too, where you can maybe acquire genetics that are very similar in terms of their environment in terms of your production as well. So we'll switch to the next slide. 
And I just wanted to reinforce the importance of crossbreeding. And I think Sean did an excellent job of kind of summarizing it in a little bit more description than this. But I think this is one area that we still do a relatively poor job as an industry. And there's so much production gain and profitability we could gain by just doing a better job of it instead of focusing on things that are far off in the future or some other research areas. I think this is a simple area of discussion that needs to be just done more consistently. So have a consistent regimented crossbreeding strategy where you kind of have a goal, you execute it properly instead of shifting towards one breed for 10 years and then realizing you've lost your heterosis and having to come back, you know, with an alternative breed. So just capitalizing on heterosis and trying to maintain as high a degree of it as you can in the herd based on the uh, slides that Sean showed. Capitalize on breed complementarity. So there's some breeds that do a lot of things really well, but arguably, you know, not one breed that does everything exactly as you prefer. So just trying to meld the different strengths amongst them in the ideal scenario. And I think that can in turn increase your marketing opportunities. If you have animals from one breed that are known for high yield, and you can meld those with animals potentially that have uh, excellent quality grade, you know, from a carcass standpoint, you've got the best of both worlds. And same thing for, you know, the British based breeds that maybe are a little bit more moderate or you use as a maternal component and then some performance sires that can still give you exceptional performance on those more moderate, lower cost cows. So just trying to figure out what the balance might be there, I think is very, very elementary, but can still be done a lot better by a lot of operations. And hybrid vigor offers the greatest opportunity and improvement in lowly heritable traits. So traits that have a big environmental component like fertility or longevity, hybrid vigor does a really good job of boosting production for those types of traits. And so I think that's a huge advantage for most cow-calf operations in terms of getting a cow to last another year or two longer and still have her be productive. And I was always told that, you know, commercial breeders should have better cattle than any purebred breeder because they've been able to capitalize on heterosis. It's just a lot of the time it's they maybe haven't picked out the elite animals, whatever variety of traits from those purebred parent breeds to make that animal, but you definitely have the opportunity to do it. I'm just going to talk about a couple of example breeding scenarios in the next slide as far as what we would maybe prioritize and look at versus what we wouldn't and this is again a little bit of a double up but if we're buying maternally oriented sires so we have a cross calf, calf operation with the rotational cross breeding system have late in the spring like a lot of folks have kind of shifted towards ears would be marketed off the cow in the fall we do raise our own replacements and also have the opportunity to merchandise some commercial replacements and basically your environment would be short grass country with large pastures and moderate feed productivity. So you look at things that are important, you want calving ease, you know, weaning weight, milk, maternal calving ease, mature cow weight, fertility, docility, and structure. So you want the cattle to come out easily, still grow well to weaning weight because that's when you're merchandising them. Milk probably doesn't need to be extensive because you've got fairly limited resources to operate on. If you're keeping replacements and selling replacements, maternal calving ease is Important because you want those daughters to calve easily. Mature cow weight probably doesn't need to get out of hand. Uh, you want them as fertile as they can be so your customers and yourself are successful. And if you're selling females, you want them to be docile for their new customers and owners as well. And structure being important for the large pastures that yeah, can cover ground. Traits you may not prioritize. One would be yearling weight because you've already marketed those calves typically at the weaning phase. And maybe if you did chase yearling weight, then that's going to make your mature cow weight increase. And that's probably not ideal in this scenario. And then unless you have a, a really good market for steer calves, go to a breeder that prioritizes it, you're receiving some type of premium, maybe carcass isn't a huge advantage to you in terms of your selection right now, because you're just not getting an economic return for it at this point. Another scenario that was kind of an alternative one is if we're buying terminal sire. So I see a lot of operations kind of shifting this direction too is that they buy all their replacements and maybe in this example British based replacements annually so they don't maintain or develop any of their own females they just purchase them every year and those heifers that they would buy would typically probably be mated to a cavities bull but then they would mate them to terminal sires in the subsequent year for the rest of their life and those females would be basically uh, or the progeny would be sent to the feedlot ownership retained and the cattle would be marketed on a quality and yield gear age combination grid. So in this scenario, yearling weight, fat ribeye marbling, feed intake and efficiency would be far more important based on the scenario. You want those cattle to keep growing and performing well at a later uh, growth stage in their life you know, from yearling 
so 15, 16 months, whatever it takes them to reach their terminal endpoint. The carcass attributes are going to be important for your quality and yield grade uh, measurements. And then you want those cattle to be efficient and not have to spend forever in the feed yard you know, with yardage and gaming. So those would be things we'd prioritize likely in this scenario. And then alternatively, the things you wouldn't look at in there as much or probably at all in some cases. Milk, you don't have to keep any female. So that doesn't really matter if you put that in your replacements that you're buying. Fertility doesn't matter so long as the bull is fertile to breed the cows. Uh, birth weight, you know, as long as it's modest or acceptable, you've got basically second calvers and older for these bulls to be mated to, so they don't have to be exceptionally light. And then maternal calving ease, again, you're not keeping any replacements, so you don't have to worry about it. So if we switch gears, I just want to talk about a, an equation that I was taught in animal breeding, and I always think about as far as progress. And I'm saying not saying that this melds exactly with profitability or what you think is the best uh, management scenario, but this is what you would typically think of in terms of making the best genetic progress, assuming that you're picking the right animals that do the job you hope they do. So there's four factors in it. In the numerator, there's three. In the denominator, there's just the single one. But if we talk about a bell curve typically with animal breeding and you're in the middle is kind of the average and then you've got outliers in both directions. So, you know, there's more animals towards the average, fewer animals are outliers. So when we talk about intensity of selection, that just means how picky or choosy you say uh, we are in terms of our selection. So if you have a replacement pen of 100 heifers and you pick out 20 to put into the next um, production phase versus 50 or 60, you're being far more selective. And theoretically that should help your genetic progress because you're taking a smaller, more elite group of those females uh, to go along with going forward. And the same can be said for bulls. If you put on hundreds or thousands of miles trying to pick an elite bull and you've been through thousands of bulls or you've picked a couple of AI sires out of several hundred options that meet your criteria and you think are elite, you've done a really good job versus um, you know, maybe looking at the two or three bulls you produced yourself and picking one out of them and not considering anybody else's genetics. So that's intensity of selection. Accuracy of selection is how well we're doing estimating the true breeding value of the animal. And so for that instance, if you think about an AI sire that has thousands of progeny with record records, we've done a really good job of trying to see what he's done as far as his progeny and where he's kind of proofed himself out at for a variety of traits. So we're highly confident that what he offers is going to actually show up in our progeny based on genetics that we used. That's compared to a young virgin bull that has no progeny that we just don't have near as much information and confidence in. So he'd be a low accuracy sire. And we'll talk about genomics a little bit later on, but that's where we want to bridge the gap is with genomics and try and increase that accuracy in younger animals versus having to take and do several years and thousands of females to prove them to a high degree to be very, very comfortable in using them. Variation is one we don't talk about a whole bunch, but basically that just means in, in a population, if you have more variability, there's more directions or avenues you can use for selection. And that can be helpful and, and a hindrance too. If you have a highly inbred population, there's gonna be less heterogeneity, but that's gonna be very consistent. The problem there is if you get into a challenge or you're not doing the right thing or your cattle don't meet the market circumstances or environment, you don't have many options to change direction. So that's where variability helps. And then on the bottom generation interval, so that's the average age of the individuals within your herd or population. And so as beef cattle, we have such a, a low prolificacy rate and a long gestation interval compared to chickens or hogs or some other species. So trying to shorten our generation interval or maintain a youthful cow herd that replaces itself and replenishes itself fairly regularly uh, is important in terms of genetic progress. And that's going to be counterintuitive or maybe not in agreement with a lot of folks as far as how they want to maintain cows for later uh, you know, stages in their life or have more longevity or avoid replacement heifer uh, production costs. But that is one factor that plays into genetic progress. Excuse me, we'll switch to the next slide. So there's lots of information available for producers. You can look at visual appraisal, which is Know, structure, frame, body dimension, color, balance, the composition or the condition the animals are in. And then there's also phenotypes. And a lot of that kind of crosses over. So we can talk about birth weights, yearling weights, scrotal, carcass, udder quality, docility, 
you know, Angus has the hoof and claw scores now. So there's some that we can measure really well as the dairy industry has done such an exceptional job of uh, with structure components, that part is increasing to And then pedigree, we have relationships amongst all the animals. We know basically who has common relatives. We have EPDs that are available, all the major breed associations and, and even some crossbreed ways to figure those out. And now we've got genomic enhanced profiles for EPDs, so just genomic profiles that we've been able to meld together with the EPDs to provide us more information. And typically, if you look through a sale catalog, you'll see some designation. This is an American Herpes EPD symbol that you can reference. Back to progeny differences, just to go over those briefly. When we talk about the phenotype that an animal possesses uh, or the measurement that we can take on them, so weaning weight, whatever the case might be, that's a combination of the genotypes, so their genetics, plus the environment's impact on those genetics, whether it's allowed them to reach their full potential or maybe it's been a constraining environment that's prevented them from reaching, reaching their maximum weight or performance level or whatever that case might be. That's what a phenotype consists of. We talk about a contemporary group that's simply a cohort of animals that experience the same uh, or an equal environment. So they've been given the same opportunity to perform, then in the same pasture, maybe uh, excluded from creek feed maybe weaned at the same day of the year and then put on the same diet subsequently. So we're just trying to manage everything in a similar manner so that their genetic differences uh, really are responsible for any physical differences between the animals. So EPDs combine information from the phenotypes, genomics, animal relationships, and then remove the environmental effect with the contemporary. And that's why it's critical is we want to get rid of environment so we can just remain with the genetic comparison of the animals to base our selection on. So there's a lot of folks that, that don't like EPDs or don't think that they are uh, trustworthy. And, you know, I guess I'm not one of them. I think they're a great tool and an effective tool, but there are things that impact how useful they are. In the next slide here, we'll talk about what's important to make them work well. So one is just pedigree connections. If you have a herd that has no records and has been basically a closed herd with no introduced genetics, it's very, very difficult to fairly compare that type of a herd against the bigger population or the rest of the breed because we just don't have any way to effectively uh, make connections between them. If you've got a herd that you've utilized AI sires heavily within or you've at least purchased bulls from other breeders to introduce and those bulls or those AI sires that came from operations with intense data collection, then we can do a really good job of trying to compare their genetics with ours and try and make some benchmarks between how ours perform relative to the genetics that they've provided and influenced our herd. Complete, accurate, and honest recording of information is paramount. So making sure that you record as much as you can for the traits that you can uh, record, making sure that your scales are accurate, and being honest, not trying to introduce bias because you think a particular animal might be more merchandisable if you skew the data. So that just comes down to breeder integrity. Accurate information or formation of contemporaries. So if you have a sick animal that maybe has a setback, you know, you could remove them and put them in a contemporary group of their own. Or if you've had to prepare, you know, a portion of the animals for a sale of some type, you know, typically you would remove them if they've experienced a different ration for a period of time than maybe what their counterparts have. So it's extremely important to try and make sure those contemporary groups are well-defined, but also trying to keep them big. Uh, and that's helpful in making the genetic comparisons a little bit more powerful. And then utilize EPDs basically in a multi-trait balanced approach. You know, you hear about people complaining about how, you know, maybe a breed has been negatively impacted by selection for a particular trait. You know, and sometimes I think that just proves how powerful EPDs can be if it's changed things that dramatically. The problem is that folks and the breeders themselves have let down because they haven't approached it in a balanced manner. Maybe they haven't looked at the associations if they pick one trait intensively, what negative impact it maybe has on other traits. So just trying to make sure that it's done in a balanced approach where you don't get carried away in, in single trait select, basically. And then there's lots of tools to try and just uh, put these EPDs and, and trying to understand them into practice. Every breed association typically has a breed query where you can just put in, you know, your maximum or minimum benchmarks for particular traits, and it'll spit out a list of bulls that you could utilize. You've got breed average tables that kind of show you where the benchmarks are. 
You have percentile tables, which will show you where a particular animal ranks in terms of the greater population. And then another one I didn't mention, but you could look up as, you know, most sire summaries published by breed associations will have a list of heritabilities for different traits. And then the genetic associations or correlations between traits. So if there's one thing that you really want to select on, but you're not sure how it might impact another trait, a lot of those can be provided to you. So the next slide is just a percentile chart for a particular animal. So if you look down the middle, that's the 50th percentile. So basically just breed average. And then as you get to the extremes on either side, typically they've listed it so that the preferential direction for each trait is on the right. And maybe the non-preferred direction is on the left. But that's completely up to you as breeders. When you make your own objectives, you get to dictate which direction you want to go or what extent you want to go. If you want to keep them more towards the mean or if you want to try and be a little bit more uh, extreme in your selection. That's all up to you. It's nothing for anybody like me to, to say, but that's just what that tool is to look at. So if we switch to another tool that can be used is selection indexes. And what selection indexes do is they just apply an economic value or weight uh, with a specific set of traits that we think influence um, a form of production or a stage of production. So if you have traits that you think are going to make a difference from a maternal standpoint or a feedlot standpoint, or maybe a certified beef standpoint, you can melt those down into indexes. And so an index is a powerful form of balanced multi-trait selection. Instead of getting confused or maybe a little bit confounded as far as looking at three or four different things and trying to figure out which way you need to go with each of them or what numbers work best, you can just look at one number. So it simplifies your selection. It probably allows you to make as quick a progress as anything by trusting that number, but that's what it comes down to is you have to trust the, the index that's provided to you. So most breed associations, again, have a maternal or a feedlot or a certified you know, Angus beef or Hereford beef index to try and select on. And that's very, very productive and powerful if you maintain that. So as we switch to genomics, we we'll just talk about this a little bit. And genomics can be very, very intimidating, but basically we're trying to look at similarities or differences within markers of the gene, uh, code or basically the genes of the animal, the genetic code, that can be associated with superior or inferior trait performance. So if we have a set of steers that we genotype and they all have exceptional performance in terms of weight, uh, you know, yearling or weaning, then what the scientists do is they try and look at those different markers and see if there's uh, markers and basically DNA that they carry in common that would explain that. Or conversely, if there's alternate alleles or genes that those folks or that those cattle are expressing uh, have really inferior trait performance. We're just trying to tie together those markers and their derivatives or traits that are expressed, whether it be really good or really bad. And then that's where we come up with, with a genetic panel to try and look at cross those markers and come up with a cumulative impact for particular traits. So a lot of these traits are impacted by a huge number of genes and we might have a limited number of markers uh, that are associated with you know a few of those genes or a moderate degree of those genes but we probably don't have every gene uh, mapped that is going to affect a specific trait so what we try and do is basically increase our accuracy if we can come up with those associations and see what sample of markers they have and whether it's associated with poor or moderate or really good performance for a trait then we have a higher degree of accuracy, what that potential young sire can do for us across a variety of traits. So it's basically a risk management or risk mitigation tool trying to figure out the genetic merit of a young animal that's unproven, doesn't have any progeny at a very young age. And they employed this in the dairy industry when they used to have to basically sire test, you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of bulls at a big cost to pick up a lot of cows when they implemented genomics they could sift through a huge number of those young sires and maybe just have to prove, you know, a couple hundred of those bulls. So that's basically trying to be more efficient in our selection at a young, young age. Genomics can alter EPDs for better or worse. So if you submit genomics for genomic enhanced EPDs, you know, be prepared that it can make them better or it can make them worse. Just because it's called enhanced doesn't mean that it's always going to come out more favorably for you. And then, you know, another example, it can just sort differences amongst full sibs or flush mates. So you talk about people and how 
different siblings can be. Traditionally with EPDs, we've basically shown that both siblings start out with the same values until we get more information individually or on their progeny to start spreading those values apart, they remain the same. With, with genomics, we can submit DNA samples on flesh mates or full siblings as baby calves and be able to distinguish some subtle differences between them at a young age and maybe base our selection on that already. And then it's continue, uh, critical to continue recording and submitting phenotypes uh, to update the genomic accuracy. That genomic tests, they have to be founded on phenotypic associations. So we have to keep validating them and updating them to make them as powerful and as accurate as possible. And the temptation for a lot of people is just to start genomic testing everything and not submitting phenotypes. And that can work for a period of time, but as we evolve and the genetics evolve, we need to keep updating those. So I think it's extremely critical to keep recording as many phenotypes as possible. <coughs> so if we switch to the next slide, this is one I find really interesting and, and hopefully you folks do too, but it's just talking about the disproportionate inheritance from our grandparents. So uh, traditionally, we think of a pedigree as being 25% uh, from our grandparents and then 50% or half of our genes from each of our parents. And it's certainly true that we get 50% of our genes from each parent. But the interesting part is how from our grandparents, we can come up with a, a portion of our genes that may be vastly different than 25%. It may be more or maybe less. So if you just track the colors, you can see in that top animal, how they've got a quarter of each color from the grandparents. If you look at the bottom animal with the two chromosomes, the top chromosome would be from the father and the bottom chromosome from the mother, you can see how there's a disproportionate coloration uh, that's come down from the grandparents. So basically what that's saying is that, you know, sometimes with people, you, you'd see a young man that looks like his grandfather. Well, maybe he got a higher proportion of his uh, genes from his grandfather than he did the other grandparents. So that's kind of just trying to be more uh, in, more intense and a little bit more specific and accurate about the representation of genes that got transmitted from one generation to the next generation. So if we next turn to the next slide, we just talk about some practical applications of genomics. So things that you and I can implement on a daily basis or commercial breeders can implement. Uh, you know, these are very, very simple, but horned, heteropold, homopold, those are tests that, uh, depending on what your scenario and, and labor are, can maybe have a big impact on what folds you're willing to source. So there's lots of breeders that can provide that information. Coat color, obviously, can distinguish between homo black or hetero black and homo red. Parent verification, you know, I think this is one that sometimes gets overlooked because it's been around for a long time and it's very simple, but Pedigree integrity is to me something that's still very important to make sure that the animal has the correct parents. I can remember a case of ours a few years ago, we had an ET mating and then a natural sire that was turned out. So the calf that arrived, we were expecting as an ET mating, but it came about two weeks late to the ET mating and about a week early to the natural service sire. And the calf was actually really light off of a recip that was known to have a lot of birth weight. So, you know, we kind of assumed that it was the the natural service sire, as it maybe was a little bit early, came at a light weight. Uh, that's how we reported it. Sent off DNA because they had to be DNA to ZT offspring, and it came back as actually the ET mating. So just little things like that, where everything would suggest the alternative, but genetics told us that actually, surprisingly, it was uh, the first case. And then if you're a commercial producer, you know this does get costly on a big scale. So you have to be very invested or believe in it. But if you want to just try and sample. You know, a group of calves that you think are superior or maybe a group of calves that are inferior, you can send off heritage verification to maybe see if those inferior calves have a common sire or if those exceptional calves have a common sire that maybe you'd like to implement to a higher degree or source similar genetics to. And on the inferior bull, maybe get rid of him from your herd because he's doing no good. Abnormality testing, several of the breeds have abnormalities, so you can just screen through those and try and you know remove them or at least know how to manage them if they are prevalent in your uh, operation or herd. And then finally, genomic enhanced DPD prediction, uh, just what we've gone through before, trying to increase the accuracy of selection for young unproven sire. 
So progeny equivalence is kind of a, and this is from the Canadian Angus Association, but it's basically just showing you the amount of information that genomics gives us in relation to the number of progeny it would take for a sire without genomics give us the same degree of confidence or accuracy in its breeding value. So it's really neat to see, particularly for kind of traits earlier in life and calving needs, that you've got a really substantial impact that genomics gives you in terms of information and knowledge and therefore accuracy and confidence, uh, 26 progeny equivalent. So I won't describe all of the traits, but you can see them for yourselves. You know, at least 10 to 12 calves worth of data or progeny worth of data is what you get with a genomic test. So basically you're taking a test on a calf that maybe hasn't even been weaned or taken off his mother, but you've already garnered as much information as you're gonna get from this many progeny that's gonna show up you know, a couple of years later, basically. So then following slide again is from Angus Association uh, on the x-axis or the horizontal axis is the number of progeny. And then on the vertical axis, is basically the gains in accuracy or the percent accuracy increases. So it just shows you that genomics in the kind of the orange color, uh, when that's when there's limited progeny, genomics gives you all of the information. But as you start to gain more and more progeny, you know your your current EPD or your traditional EPD takes over in terms of accuracy because what the traditional EPD does, it measures the phenotype. And that's the cumulative effect of all the genes that impact that particular trait. We talked about earlier how with the genomics, we can quantify several of the markers within genes that might affect a particular trait, but we probably don't know all of them or all the genes that impact a trait. Whereas in EPD, we don't know them, but we know the cumulative impact that they've given us. And so we do a better job with actually traditional EPDs. Genomics, probably the importance of the genomics uh, dissipates over uh, over time as we increase the number of progeny. So genomics aids in difficult uh, and hard to measure traits. And that's something that is really unique. In the next slide, if we can measure traits um, like long-term longevity, fertility, health traits, you know, feedlot, shipping fever complex, those types of things, if we can find genomics that allow us to be more uh, selective in, in either addressing those deficiencies or increasing those strengths, then that's a really powerful tool. But the problem is it's very, very challenging to develop these markers and these genomic panels uh, for those types of traits because the phenotypes are hard to come by. So it's kind of a vicious cycle where we're trying to fix a challenge, but we have to overcome a challenge of measuring those phenotypes initially to even create that panel. Uh, but there are people that are researching and doing that and trying their best uh, to help the rest of the industry by putting those types of studies together. And then this is just another reinforcement of continuing to report phenotypes is extremely important. So transition now to kind of some things that Sean talked about as far as just selecting a seed stock provider. You've laid out all of your goals and intentions and your breeding objectives. Uh, what's kind of the next step? So trying to find uh, for us, it typically comes down to the top line as far as an operation that we think that people are professional, where we think they're intelligent, or they're uh, trustworthy, they've shown integrity. You know, a lot of times that's what it comes down to us. There's a lot of cattle that we will bypass uh, because we don't think some of those factors are in play. And there's sometimes where the cattle maybe aren't exactly where you want them to be, but you definitely keep an eye on those people because you think they're doing it the right way. And you're excited to see where they can progress. So another point would be to just consider a similar breeding philosophy or environment. And Sean alluded to that as well. If you can find animals that are very closely or similarly already adapted to your environment, I think that's going to alleviate a lot of concerns or just that they share a lot of the same uh, thoughts on production or management or labor availability or feed resources. If you have animals that have already been bred towards those goals, it should minimize some of the effort on your part or at least meld better with your goals and intentions. Customer service, do you feel like you are uh, just a number and the bull gets dropped off and you don't hear much more from the folks? Or do you feel like they've done their very best to try and learn about you and what can make you successful and maintain a strong relationship and follow up? And, and we can all do a better job of that, but I think that's one thing that can definitely set the elite folks apart. Comprehensive information and data collection, maybe that's important to you or maybe it's not, but you know, I always think if a person is very stringent on what they do in terms of data collection and 
providing you as much information as they can, they probably do a really good job of the rest of their operation as well. And then just the simple things, looking at the superior cow herd, uh, the structural integrity of the cattle, the maternal strength, you know, the things that sometimes folks who label uh, numbers gurus as bypassing were in fact, you know, those are things that everybody should do. It's just that sometimes with more information, you want to take your selection to another level. So once we've kind of isolated the folks that maybe want to purchase from, you know, what happens in making that decision to actually go ahead and buy a bull or buy a group of females. So you have your defined expectations and your goals in mind. Just go ahead and research the animals in terms of their information. So pictures, videos, uh, if you can visit the breeder and see his entire cow herd, that'll give you a great idea of, of what their uh, depth of their cow herd looks like. I mean, sometimes you can see some elite animals, but maybe the rest of the herd is not all that special. Uh, and sometimes it maybe is really, really refreshing to see how many great options there are, or how many bulls that maybe would suit your purposes that you hadn't initially isolated. So look at the sires, dams, the progeny, the tibs, uh, you know, all the information the breeder can give you, the quarries from the breed associations, all the information that's out there can really make, you know, some informed and, and neat decisions for you. And then select the options that might suit you for intended purposes relative to your budget. If you have 10 or 12 bulls that might suit you, you know, that's going to hopefully allow you to get one bought, maybe if the others can't suit your budget. And there's a lot of folks that don't like going to sales because they think the average is too high, but that's always the fun for us is to try and go to a sale where, yeah, sure, they sell great, but, you know, usually every year, every couple of years, you can find a bull that fits within your price range that you can be ecstatic about uh, his physical features or his breeding attributes uh, without having to compromise on where you got him or, or what kind of quality it was. So I think always keep that in mind. That's part of the fun of it. Feel free to provide feedback to the breeder. So if you think they did an excellent job on developing the bulls or you're really not happy and thought maybe this year they pushed them a little bit too hard or if you're not really on board with kind of the new purchases that they're putting into their herd from a genetic standpoint I think it's feel free to provide that input because I think a lot of those breeders want to hear that and sometimes a, a silent clientele or if they haven't solicited some opinions you know it's it's kind of frustrating to not get some of that information back so I think uh, an interactive and very high degree of communication a lot of times is going to make a better relationship and make everybody happier. And then if you have any concerns, just make sure that they know about it instead of trying to tell other folks or to you know, be negative or critical. You know, sometimes those things can be resolved very easily and favorably if you just make it apparent to them. So those are just a couple of considerations. Again, nothing groundbreaking, but just things to think of when you talk to or source animals from a provider. And then versatile genetics, I don't know if that's the right word, but you know, sometimes it comes down to just trying to put as much good into the animals that you're selecting or breeding as what you can. So if you can seed stock provider, create animals that are going to work for the commercial cow man in terms of calving ease and growth and fertility and longevity, but also have the ability to be efficient, have some end product merit, uh, and then just ultimately go to the consumer in terms of retail purchases and provide them a quality eating experience. That's what it's all about. So just trying to not limit yourself as far as your portion of the production chain, but thinking that long term, there are other areas and in, in genetic components that you can fix in the cattle to provide more profitability to you, but also to the next segments of the industry. So for each segment of production, just trying to keep in mind their importance. And I think if you build more strengths into your cattle and your livestock, you just broaden your marketing opportunities and the demand for your cattle. So if you don't believe in EPDs, but you've still selected for superior ones, you know, you don't limit yourself uh, to the people that maybe would consider purchasing from you. And then I think as we try and differentiate, distinguish ourselves in terms of our qualities, you know, there's some value added opportunities that are starting to become more prevalent. So if you sell steers online or if you sell direct or you have, uh, you know, incorporated some of the sustainability practices and protocols, you're trying to build more value by doing a more exceptional job. And hopefully that gets rewarded at some point. Well, in summation, I just want to say I think it's more challenging uh, to do these things, and it's definitely going to take a smaller number of animals or a lower proportion of the population to meet very stringent requirements, but I think that's part of the fun of it. So it's very challenging to find those animals that do a lot of things really well, but at the end of the day, that's what makes it a unique experience and hopefully more profitable for us if we can accomplish that. And I think if you look at the commercial breeders or the purebred breeders that have cow herds that excel in a multitude of areas, 
uh, you know, typically they've been successful for. That's the summary. I just want to thank all of you guys again, and we can open any questions. Here. Perfect. Thank you for that, Lance. And there are a number of questions um, that have started rolling in already. So if you do have some questions, you can type those into the Q&A section or into the uh, chat box. Um, I see Sean has already been working on a few here in the Q&A. Um, and actually, I think I'd like to get uh, Sean to repeat his answer to one of them. Um, this was a question from Melanie. Um, at what point does heterosis become diluted to the point that it no longer results in an advantage? For example, a Simangus second calvers then bred semitol until they leave the herd. Um, and Sean and Lance, both of you feel free to answer that one. Yeah, so it, it's, it's gonna vary a little bit. So I'll, in this specific scenario, like that Simangus heifer is going to have maximum heterosis. So as an individual, she's going to express the maximum maternal heterosis her entire lifetime. Um, and that resulting calf from year three on, so it's uh, two thirds Simmental, one third Angus, if my math is right. Um, it's going to have about two thirds of individual heterosis, but it will be raised on a mother that has maximum heterosis. So you're going to, you're going to be about Two thirds of maximum is kind of kind of what the math would be. Okay, uh, we have a question here from Fred. Some seed stock producers do feed tests on their bulls, and sometimes can provide feed efficiency or RFI. How valuable is the growth and efficiency data from feed trials? Can this information be replaced by EPDs or GEPDs? That might be a question for Lance, maybe. Yeah, so there's, you know, I guess in our breed, I know there's a handful, well, basically three or four folks, and then, you know, some of the colleges and universities that have residual feed intake um, collection facilities. So, you know, you could look at the individual data itself by those breeders, and we do have an EPD in our breed uh, for residual feed intake, but it would be primarily based on the phenotypes from that limited number of, of breeders. So, you know, I, that's a challenging one. It's one of those traits for us as a breed and probably for several breeds where it just hasn't been broadly uh, accepted as far as reporting phenotypes for that. So, you know, I think that's probably one of the, <clears throat> one of the traits where you'd probably be best to look at both and, and definitely kind of go through um, those individual herds. And I think one thing you could look at is just to see where those bulls might index in those individual herds uh, that are really intensely doing it. You know, I, th I think that would be one of my alternatives is to see what maybe the premier ones or maybe the weaker ones within those individual herd would be that, that are doing that type of testing because it might be at this point best information compared to finding animals that just simply haven't had it. And as far as the genomic part of it, again, it's one of those traits where, where we're continually trying to advance it, but it's probably not where we want it to be quite yet uh, compared to obviously the weight traits and those types. I'm not sure if that answers it but um, it's kind of a middle ground I would say on that one because we, we probably don't have the volume of data that we'd really like to be super comfortable you know on a broad basis evaluating the EPDs there but it is in place and it's better than nothing but I think a combination over there would suit me best. Excellent okay here's a here's an interesting question here uh, I know dairy is showing AI SARS with better immunity how far out are we in the beef industry um, for having the immunity traits in the bulls, I think is the question. That'll answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a ways out still. I know Colorado State, from what I know, has done, is the last several years has done a lot of research, but I don't know, honestly, you know, where that's at. I wouldn't say that it's probably or where they'd like it to be or where it needs to be, but it, it is something that's being worked on. I just don't know that there's you know, tangible results or tangible methods to maybe isolate those genetics at this point. And if John knows different, but I know that's one place that has, has worked on it extensively and is making concerted effort towards it, but I don't know that uh, we'd be anywhere close to where the dairy is at this point. 
Yeah, and, and there is some work being done um, on immune response. I know Canadian Angus has done some work, um, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's at a point yet where we're ready for a genetic evaluation and, and sorting through the, all those animals. Okay, there was another question here that you had answered, Sean. Um, do you find EPDs are an accurate enough indication in a crossbred operation or is a more in-depth DNA test needed for commercial animals? Yeah, so if, if you're a commercial operation that's sourcing seed stock, so I'll, I'll use the term loosely purebred or, or identified seed stock, um, EPDs are by far the best tool available. Um, if you are a commercial operation looking at, say, taking bulls out of your own cow herd or retaining heifers, um, it is possible for you to get EPDs, depending either some programs you can participate in. Um, but a genomic test is probably, probably a, a useful tool. Um, even if it's just as simple as, as knowing the parentage and tying it back to the genetics that are going into that replacement heifer. Okay, well, I think this will be our last question here. Um, in your opinion on F1 or hybrid bulls, if you are breeding commercial cows that are crossbred themselves, um, so I guess, is it a good idea? I guess it depends how crossbred your cows are. You know, the, I'll, I'll mention this: the the F one bull. It's a it's a touchy subject because you know, as a purebred breeder, if you do it, you open yourself up to a new clientele potentially, but you also open yourself up to ridicule because a lot of people uh, are dead set against it. So, you know, it's not something we've done or necessarily would consider immediately, but I can definitely see the advantages. You know, I think one place where it would work well is if you've got a straight red herd already that you're wanting to introduce um, neurosis into. So if you have a you know, some Angus bull or some type of, of hybrid bull that you use on, you know, basically straight red cows, I think that's one, you know, neat place. And, and just like Sean talked about the maternal heterosis, there is paternal heterosis. Those bulls can potentially breed a larger number or service you know, more cows maybe be a little bit more hardy or whatever the case might be than than just a, a straight bred or a purebred animal so there's paternal heterosis too and that's one thing to consider but you know i think it's very unique to each circumstance i think there's places where it doesn't work and and a lot of people have mentioned you know with crossbred bulls or hybrid bulls the <clears throat> just the inconsistency and i think that one genomic slide talking about kind of disproportionate inheritance from grandparents, you know, that explains a lot of the perceived inconsistency that hybrid bulls maybe introduces compared to if you're just using a, um, you know, a purebred bull. So uh, it's a touchy subject. And I think it's kind of an individual scenario determines whether I, I would consider it or not, but I, I think there's definitely places for it. And I can see why people uh, certainly prefer to utilize. It. Yeah. The, the other place I would add to that is, if the F1 is put together with consistency, um, so similar type, similar type profiles on either side of their pedigree, um, they really do have a place in terms of cow herd management. So you can get some retained heterosis, maintain some breed, some breed composition. There obviously can be some, some variation in that in the offspring, um, but it can simplify the equation if you've got a set of cows and you can, instead of taking, let's say your Sim Angus cows and, and breeding them Angus until they are three quarters Angus and then going back Simmental to the three quarters Simmental, um, it can simplify some of that management. Um, so so there's, there's some merit there as well. Excellent, well, thank you, Lance and Sean. Uh, there's just a couple more important things to let you know about before we go. One is to, is how to get more information and science-based production advice through the BCRC. Go to our website, beefresearch.ca and click on the subscribe button to sign up for our free email list. If you've got Twitter, Facebook, or a YouTube account, you can connect with us there at Beef Research. If you haven't already, uh, please take 
just a few minutes of your time to fill out the research and technology transfer strategy that closes on March 5th. We do want to hear from you. And don't miss our next and last webinar for this series on record keeping for forage and grassland management that will be on March 24th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. You'll receive an email from me in a couple of days with a link to watch the reporting as well as links to some additional information on genetics and breeding decisions. Um, and at the end of this webinar, you may be directed to a survey if you can take a few minutes of your time to fill this out, it's very helpful when we are creating the next webinar series. And that is it for me. So thanks to you at home for joining us tonight. And on behalf of everyone, thank you, Sean and Lance, for volunteering your time and expertise with us this evening. Thank you. Super. Thanks, everybody. Good night.